Dobry večer. I'm David Knowles, and welcome to a special week of Ukraine, the latest. You might be able to hear in the background of this recording a train. That's because myself, Francis Sternley, Dom Nichols, and our wonderful producers, Adley Pojman Ponte and Jack Leather, are on the night train to Kiev. It's been a very long day of travel for us. We've flown to Warsaw. Um, I think, Dom and Francis, you guys met a listener on the plane. Is that right? We did indeed. A very nice gentleman who was actually listening to the podcast that we did at the US Embassy during the week on the plane. Just to paint you a bit of a picture here, um, we are in a four-person sleeper car sort of compartment. Dom Nichols is sitting opposite me. His shoes are off. The window is open. Francis Sternley is next to me, but he's taking the bottom bunk. Shaq is standing outside in the corridor with a camera at the ready. And Adelaide's very kindly holding the, uh, the microphone in front of me. So just to explain very very quickly, we'll, we'll be in Kiev for a week. So if you're there and you see us, do, do you shout, do you wave? And all of us will be out and about interviewing people and trying to do our best to talk to ordinary Ukrainians and people in positions of power and authority who can shed more light on what's happening this week and the previous two years. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all of your support over the past few years. And we carry on. Dobry večer. I'm Roland Oliphant, and this is Ukraine, the latest Today we bring you the latest news from Ukraine as Russia claims control of a Soviet-era coke plant in Avdiivka, cementing its control of the city. And Kaya Kalas, Estonia's Prime Minister, calls on the West to seize Russia's frozen assets before the US election. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 19th of February, one year and 359 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by Joe Barnes and Natalia Vasilieva. Coming up, we have an interview with Yulia Timoshenko, a friend of the podcast and influencer, who David interviewed this morning. And James Rothwell, our Berlin correspondent, has an exclusive interview with Kirsty Kalulade, the former president of Estonia. Let's start with military updates from Ukraine. The Russians this morning have claimed final control of the coke and chemical plant in Avdiivka, cementing their control of the city. The Russian's defense ministry said its troops had advanced about nine kilometers or five miles in the Donetsk region of the front line following that battle. Ukraine confirmed that it pulled out of Avdiivka following several months of fighting on Saturday. The Russians say they've now destroyed the final pocket of resistance inside that huge sprawling industrial plant that the town was basically built around. So we've got the Russian Defence Ministry saying the centre grouping of troops taking the offensive took full control of the coke plant. The Russian flags were hoisted on the administrative buildings of the plant. Russian state television has showed blue and yellow Ukrainian flags being taken down in Avdiivka. Uh, the Russian tricolour, white, blue, red being raised. Vladimir Putin has hailed the taking of Avdiivka as an important victory, congratulated his troops. This is the biggest Russian victory since the fall of Bakhmut, and it is likely to be trumpeted very, very loudly by the Kremlin for obvious reasons. There is a little bit of pushback from the Ukrainians. They confirm that they've retreated from Avdiivka, uh, but they're saying that more than 17,000 Russians were killed during the battle. The capture was probably one of the Kremlin's most costly victories, but nonetheless, this is without question a Russian victory, no matter what the cost of it was. Elsewhere, if you go around the line to uh, Robotinia, to the site in Zaporizhia region of the major counteroffensive last summer. The Russians are also pushing there. So Ukrainian troops, it was said this morning, were under heavy fire from Russian forces in that area around the village of Robotinia, which is one of the few villages that were captured during last summer's counteroffensive. Um, so it's Ukraine's army spokesman, Dmitry Lihovoy, said the situation is dynamic here. The enemy is inflicting heavy fire. He said the Russians had attacked with armoured vehicles, that attack had been repulsed and that they were now advancing with smaller assault groups supported by armour. The Deep State Telegram channel, which anyone who's familiar with the war will be familiar with and is believed to be close to the Ukrainian armed forces, did say last night on Sunday evening that Russia had managed to break through defences at Verbovia. That's the other village that was finally taken in last 
summer's offensive a few kilometers east of Robertinia. Um, and Rebar, the Russian telegram channel, which is close to the Russian Ministry of Defense, has said that the Russians have gained a foothold in the outskirts of Robertinia. Neither of those claims can be immediately verified, but it's quite clear that up and down the line, the Russians have the initiative and where they're not making gains, they're definitely trying to. Elsewhere, the war in the air. Ukraine said today that it had shot down two more Russian fighter jets. So Alexander Siersky, that's the newly installed commander-in-chief, and Lieutenant General Mikola Oleshuk, who's the commander of the Air Force, have both said on social media that they shot down one Su-35, that's a single-seater fighter, one Su-34, which is a two-seater, had been shot down. Uh, Oleshuk said the Su-35 pilot was floating face down in the Azov Sea, and he tweeted a map that showed a location somewhere north of Mariupol for the location of the Su-34 crew. He didn't give any information about whether they are believed to be alive. Ukraine said it shot down all four Shahad attack drones launched by Russia overnight. The Air Force also said in a morning update. And meanwhile, an oil depot is reported to have caught fire in Makivka. Uh, That's a Russian-occupied city in the Donetsk region that's been held by Russia since the 2014 war. Footage on fire on social media shows a cloud of thick black smoke rising into the air from the depot, located about 10 miles, 10 kilometers east of Donetsk. Local media report an explosion at the site caused by a Ukrainian attack, and the parts of the city have been cut off from electricity. We don't have any further official confirmation from the Ukrainians there. That is more or less the military picture this morning. I'd like to go over to Joe to bring us up to speed on the political and diplomatic developments. Joe, are you there? Hi, Roland. Yes, loud and clear in here. So, yeah, first of all, let's look at the political and diplomatic responses to the major news, which is Avdiivka. Um, so when I was at NATO HQ last week for a meeting of NATO defence ministers and talking to various intelligence types and officials over there, the message was quite clear that Ukraine's defence of the industrial town had collapsed, in part owing to the dwindling supplies of Western weaponry. Mainly what they said was artillery shells, which is quite evident, but also air defence systems and interceptors. And that seems to be very striking. It's not as spoken about as much, but basically Russia had free reign to drop these unguided glide bombs on Avdivka uh, in more intensively as that sort of battle escalated until its culmination and Ukraine's withdrawal. But while Ukrainian troops were withdrawing from Avdivka, the Munich Security Conference, which can only be described as a Glastonbury for security wonks, was being held in Germany. And the initial response to the ammunition shortage was interesting. So Denmark's Prime Minister on Sunday said that her country was handing over all of its shells to Ukraine as she urged other European states to do the same or provide more weapons. So this is what Meta Fredriksen had to say. We decided to donate our entire artillery. Um, I'm sorry to say, friends, there is still ammunition in stock in Europe. This is not a question about production because we have weapons, we have ammunition, we have our defences that we don't have to use at the moment that we should deliver to Ukraine. We have to do more. So, yeah, quite interesting. And then she also added a bit on the F-16 fighter jets, because Denmark is currently training Ukrainian pilots in Denmark to fly them. Then Ms. Fredrickson said Denmark would deliver F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine and was still seeking more partners to supply the advanced fighter jets. Back to the artillery shells, Czech President Peter Pavel, who is a former sort of NATO commander, came up with a similarly ambitious promise when he said his country's defence ministry and local sort of Czech industry types had discovered some 800,000 units of available ammunition to give to Ukraine. That's broken down into half a million NATO standard 155 millimetre artillery shells and 300,000 122 millimetre sort of Soviet calibre shells. He said these could be delivered to Ukraine within weeks, and he said that at a press briefing. But what's the catch, you ask? Why is it this simple? Pavel said, basically, countries have to find money to pay for this. He said that he was in talks with Denmark, Canada, and the Netherlands about raising the cash. Ultimately, I don't think the cash will be the stumbling block here. It will probably get done at some point. Weeks is probably ambitious, but I'm sure stocks will start trickling over to Kiev within weeks. But what I do find interesting is the Czechs have basically acknowledged that the EU's ability to ramp up production or find stocks within Europe failed when the EU promised to deliver one million artillery shells to Ukraine by March of this year. And it looks like the Czechs have basically cast their net further afield to try and find these supplies. Think back to when 
the US went to South Korea and bought up lots of existing stocks of 155 millimeter shells. The Pickhams also came from South Korea, we believe, to give to Ukraine. So it's that sort of thinking that is now apparent and becoming clear within people's efforts to find artillery stocks to get to Ukraine. But then zooming out from the individual announcements from leaders in Munich, and we should look at the security conference in a wider context. Obviously, the struggles of Ukraine and how the West responds to the Ukrainian plight was a guaranteed topic. But the death of Alexei Navalny and Donald Trump's threat to NATO created another storm cloud over the West. And we'll touch on the latter to later. So I wasn't in Munich myself, but our colleague James Rothwell was. But what from basically spending my weekend on Twitter and reading on speeches and watching live streams, etc. I got the sense from the outside that we might have reached a point in Europe where the continent and its governments acknowledge finally that they didn't move fast enough for Ukraine when they had the chance. And now we're all involved in this entrenched conflict that every Western official I keep speaking to compares to World War I, trench warfare, but with the added extras of drones buzzing around the sky, causing a right nuisance. So, without the US, support for Ukraine appears a bit rudderless. It doesn't seem to be anyone stepping up to the mantle and really taking responsibility for Europe's drive to get stuff to Ukraine. You'd remember the US runs the Ramstein initiative, where it's a group of about 50 to 54 of Ukraine's Western allies deliver and coordinate aid deliveries. But then also the US doesn't seem to have any answers of how it can get through the congressional blockages to deliver its 60 billion in promised military aid for Ukraine. So of all the US officials I've spoken to in recent weeks, they insist that plan A is the only plan. But we're now almost two months since the last US delivery of lethal aid to Ukraine with no end in sight to that pause. Perhaps time has come for that plan to be reviewed and maybe a plan B is thought of. But from other other people I think speak to and discuss this with, there just seems to be an element of groupthink in Biden's foreign policy team in as such that there basically isn't one or maybe two or three voices that are different and saying, look, we're actually failing here. Let's like not just plow on, run straight at the existing problem. Let's look at ways around it. And it just seems to have that sort of narrative just seems to have allowed the planned aid to languish in the hands of what is literally a handful of Republicans in Congress. But then also what I get is another sense that unless it's incredibly, incredibly secret, there doesn't seem to be an overall strategy in the West to deliver on that promise, that Western rhetoric of supporting Ukraine until a victory against Russia. And how we and the question is basically how do we deliver on that promise? As we've discussed Time and time again, there isn't a silver bullet in terms of weapons. There isn't an apparent willingness to equip another sort of 10 Ukrainian assault brigades as we did before the counteroffensives. But then there are slight plans floating around, but they do seem a bit high in the sky, like supplying thousands of AI powered drones that can swarm and overwhelm targets. But essentially, while I appreciate that, if it actually works, would be amazing for Ukraine and do work wonders helping them overcome long-range deficiencies in terms of numbers. Do we know if that technology actually works yet? Is it battlefield ready? Probably not. Then let's but let's now zoom out, leave Munich behind and go to go over to Ukraine, where Ukraine's army has accused Russian forces of shooting two prisoners of war and posting a grainy video shot from the air, which the Ukrainians said proved the incident. In the video, two soldiers labelled as Ukrainians run towards another labelled as Russian in a trench. The Russian soldier then grabs them and shoots them numerous times until they stop moving before turning back. The two men do not appear to have resisted capture. This is what Ukraine's ground forces had to say about it. This morning, the Russians once again showed their attitude to international humanitarian law by shooting two Ukrainian prisoners of war. And they said that the incident happened within the Hortzia group of troops, which operates on the Eastern Front. Russia and Ukraine have both accused each other several times of violating international humanitarian law by killing prisoners of war or mistreating them. Again, we cannot verify the authenticity of the video or the location. I will stop there and we will hand over back to you, Roland and Natalia. Thanks for that update, Joe. Just to follow up on, on what you were saying there about the American position, Joe Biden was, was talking, was asked about Avdivka 
um, uh, over the weekend. His administration has linked the loss of Avdiivka explicitly to congressional inaction on that $60 billion military aid. And he said he told uh, Vladimir Zelensky on a phone call on Saturday after Ukraine said it was withdrawing from the town that he remained confident U.S funding would eventually come through. But when reporters asked him, are you confident a deal could be struck before Ukraine loses more territory? He responded, I'm not. And there is plenty of reporting around today speaking to troops who've been fighting in Avdiivka about just how tangible that shortage of ammunition felt. I mean, the, the, the IP um, quoting a soldier called Chaklun uh, from the 110th Brigade who said that the Russians basically had realized how short the Ukrainians were and they st- of ammunition and started sending smaller infantry groups to engage Ukrainian forces at close quarters. Uh, so they had to s- expend more ammunition to keep them at bay. The quote from the AP is, the enemy also understands and feels our capabilities, and with that, they managed to succeed. And with that, I'd like to move away from the battlefield uh, and events inside Ukraine to events in Russia, because the other very dramatic, very, very sad event over the end of last week was the death in a Russian prison of Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. Natalia has been following this story closely. In fact, she's been reporting on Alexei Navalny for years and years and years. Natalia, if you're there, could you bring us up to speed on what the latest is on that story? Hi, Roland, and hi, everyone. Yeah, quite a tragic weekend for a lot of people. Reports about Navalny's death first came in on Friday. And just so that everyone understands, Navalny is kept in a prison colony several time zones away in Moscow. It's not something that can be reached easily. His mother didn't get there until Saturday morning. And now this is Monday afternoon in that part of the world. And uh, Navalny's mother still has not been able to see the body of her son. She's been visiting every single office. There is a mortuary in the regional capital, Salihard, the Salihard, the local office of the investigative committee, Russia's top investigative body. According to Navalny's allies, the only conclusive reply that she has got so far is that the post-mortem has been extended and that authorities are withholding Navalny's body for some further checks and examinations. We still don't know where this body is. Initially, Russian officials denied that it was transported to the regional capital, Salihard. But we have some signs that it is probably there. Russian journalists from the exiled media outlet Media Zona uh, did quite a bit of legwork studying um, CCTV footage, publicly available footage from the area. And they managed to spot a motorcade driving from on a highway from where Navalny's prison was uh, to the regional capital, Salihard. But I guess the a, a bigger piece of news this morning that probably outshone everything else is a it's quite a remarkable speech by Alexei's widow, um, Yulia, Yulia Navalny, who recorded a video saying that she will keep up the fights of her husband. She spoke about endless grief and endless pain, and she asked Navalny supporters to share not only her pain, but also um, Navalny's determination to see a better Russia, a free, a peaceful and a democratic Russia, as she put it. And uh, yeah, I would say that's that's the biggest news so far, because since... Navalny died since the first we heard about reports. Obviously, there was a lot of confusion in the opposition camp. Talk about who will pick up the mantle. Obviously, Navalny's shoes are incredibly big to fill. And Yulia has been with Navalny all along, but she has kept a low profile. She never had a political role of herself. And obviously, she herself and her kids are going through this enormous tragedy but she made it clear that she while she is grieving it also it's very important to her to do what Alexei thought would be very important and she would pick up the mantle and later today unless it has already happened she is meeting with the foreign ministries of the European Union in quite a significant step that obviously shows that she's quite serious about making sure that the Putin regime is punished for that because we heard earlier this weekend that both both the United States and the U.S. are going to think of a way of going after the Putin regime for, if not killing uh, Alexei Navalny in jail, but at least allowing him to die. So, yes, it looks like uh, Yulia will now have a prominent role, in, at least in the campaign, to bring to justice uh, those who are responsible for his killing. Mm-hmm. I mean, as you mentioned, there's still this question mark over the cause of death. Uh, was he murdered? Did he die of other causes? No one can say for certain. I think Yulia Navalny has, has released a video, I think, this morning, 
saying that he was killed by Novichok, by the infamous chemical weapon, and that's why they're blocking the family from seeing the body. Do, do we know anything else about that, or are we, are we completely in the dark uh, in the realms of speculation? Here? I think I need to correct you on that. If you look at the original remarks, what she, the way she put it, she said, what we're seeing right now is official attempts to cover up the traces of the evidence that they might be. And she described it as another Novichok of Vladimir Putin. So I would say it's not a Novichok with a capitalized letter. What she's talking about is she's talking about some sort of a tool that the Kremlin used to kill him, which could be anything. Obviously, she's referring to Novichok as the poison that was reportedly used to try and kill him almost four years ago. I don't think she specifically meant that they know for sure it was the Novichok, the military grade chemical dating back to, to Soviet military labs. But she did speak of about foul play and her message is that she is certain that he was killed. But it's obviously it's a matter of time to figure out how exactly that happened. And th- this obviously caused a huge amount of shock. I think it's mm. fair to say a lot of Russians were completely stunned by this news. But th- yeah. it, there's been a couple of days for it to, to sink in. How, with the benefit of those couple of days to think and chew it over, what's your feeling about what this actually means for the Russian opposition, but also for Vladimir Putin's regime and ultimately for the war? Is this a significant moment as it feels, or is the reality that actually he was so marginalized by this point and effectively powerless that although it seems very, very dramatic moment, it doesn't change much? It is a dramatic moment and it might turn out to be a turning point. I would not necessarily agree that he was marginalized. Um, I think it speaks volumes that despite the fact that Navalny has been jailed for almost for three years now, that he did have a, a role in, in Russian politics, although he was constantly in solitary confinement. He was gradually put into conditions that are more and more isolating and which made it more and more difficult for his allies, his supporters to communicate with him. But he was still there. And I know that he still shared his thoughts and ideas with his team. He was the one who recently supported this idea of showing up at polling stations on the day of the Russian so-called elections at noon exactly, you know, in a country where any form of protest has been outlawed, he suggested that this would be a safe way to show that they are, we are here and we are, we are laughing at those elections, which are not an election, is not a free and fair competition. So he was able to influence Russian politics even behind the bars. And obviously it's a massive loss. And it, it raises the question of who will be there to pick up the mantle. And it remains to be seen if Yulia, his widow, will be able to do that. I think the main thing about Navalny and his existence, even though he was not a free man, he was not there to lead protests, he was he became a symbolic figure for many Russians in his three years behind bars. In the past three days, I've heard many people referring to him as a symbol of hope. There was this idea that however long the Putin regime lasts, however long it takes for this regime to decompose or to be toppled, Navalny is always going to be there. That Navalny is Russia's Nelson Mandela-like figure. And when the time comes, when the time is right, Navalny will be there with his idea, with his boundless optimism, with his popular mandate. So it's a huge moment of this, this disappointment and it's a huge moment of despair right now because there's i think opposition supporters in russia they didn't have a clear picture and a clear resolutions b- before but now it's even more vague because there's this feeling that we don't know who's going to be there to take over from him there's always this thought that Navalny is always there with his ideas and optimism and popular mandate and now he's not i just want to ask you it's just I just feel like we haven't had an opportunity to really talk about this moment. So just before I go to the other chaps in Ukraine, I think I did want to ask you lastly about that, you know, this question about the war. A lot of Ukrainians Uh didn't have much time for Alexei Navalny. So sometimes they say he would be even worse than Putin. They felt Uh rightly or wrongly that, I mean, speak for a lot of people I've spoken to, that he represented this stereotype that you scratch a Russian liberal and there's there's an imperialist underneath or Russian liberalism ends at Ukraine and so on. But nonetheless... In public, he was very anti-war. And if there was anybody to represent the anti-war Russians, I suppose he would have been. What does this mean for the future of the war? Does does it mean that the relatively marginalized constituency who were anti-war are simply even more marginalized? What's your feeling about that? I mean, that constituency was decimated as it is. 
And it's under immense pressure, as we saw when thousands of people tried to merely mourn Navalny, tried to merely bring flowers to monuments. A lot of them were arrested just for that gesture alone. The anti-war sentiment is still there. It, uh, people might be repressed. They don't have this clear-cut leadership figure as they did in Navalny. But that anti-war segment of society is still there, as we saw from a very quick aborted campaign of uh, Boris Nadezhdin, an obscure politician who suddenly said that he will campaign on an anti-war ticket. And his uh, short-lived campaign, which purely consisted of collecting signatures in his favor, attracted an enormous following, enormous immediate following. So obviously shows that anti-war sentiment is still there. And it will, it's definitely going to be more difficult to galvanize it when there's no figure like Navalny. But I would say for, the, for what happens on the battlefield, um, if we're being completely fair, I, I don't think it wasn't within Navalny's power or within the power of Navalny's supporter to do anything at this point with the Kremlin as entrenched as it is right now. Uh, Natalia, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, for any listeners wondering why I am in the presenter's chair, it's because our regulars, Dom, Francis and David, are on assignment in Ukraine. I believe they've just arrived and I think they are somewhere, I'm not sure if they're in Kiev or somewhere else, in a cafe willing to talk to us. Chaps, if you're there, please unmute and give us an update. Hi, Roland. Dobry Den from Kiev. It's an absolutely beautiful day here in the Ukrainian capital. There are blue skies, the sun is out. It's incredibly warm for the middle of February. So I'm here, yeah, with Francis, Dom, um, Adley and Jack, our audio and video producers. We are in a cafe just around the corner from our hotel. It's absolutely beautiful just to set the scene. You can probably hear the music in the background. There's a mural of John Lennon made out of coffee beans on, on one side of the cafe. Everybody's had shashukas and Adley's looking very content with all of that. We started traveling yesterday morning. We flew from London to Poland and then took the night train from Helm all the way to Kiev. It arriving at around midday Ukrainian time. So we've really only really had time to have a quick shower, come out and have something to eat before thinking about what we're doing later. For those of you who haven't been in, on a Ukrainian night train before, myself, Jack, Francis and Dom had a four bed compartment. It was smaller. I mean, it was only a couple of meters squared, wasn't it? So it was an elaborate dance of trying to work out who's getting top bunk and how to undress and get into bed and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure who was snoring louder, Jack or Dom, but we didn't get too much sleep, but arrived in the Ukrainian capital. It was fairly smooth. Dom, it's not the first time we've shared the night train to together but how did you pass the time how did you make the hours go a bit quicker this time well i was repeatedly woken up by francis trying to raid the crisps without anyone <laughs> noticing and actually when we were all together francis was regaling us with stories of his wayward youth which we won't repeat here because there might be children listening but other than that it was we were just getting ready for the whole series of interviews that we've got lined up for this week over the next few days uh, won't say with whom that we got them lined up, but uh, we'll let you know as soon as afterwards. But it should be a very exciting week. And uh, yeah, and then I just basically tried to pretend I was asleep every time he kept saying, Dom, 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 are you awake? Are you awake? Are you awake? Dom, 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 are you awake? Also, very quickly, we came in. Don't worry, Francis, we'll give you first right of reply in a second. There was a lovely moment going through Helm, which is the town in Poland where you do change from. Polish trains and you get onto the night train to Kiev and I've never gone through that I don't think any of us had entered Ukraine through that direction through that way before you might have done Roland so you might know what I'm talking about but there's a sort of big station everybody's hanging around for several hours before the next train arrives and you'll get on it so we got some food and then I got a tap on the shoulder and it was friend of the podcast Julia Timoshenko who we've interviewed before who was also traveling back to Kiev so we had a lovely time catching up with Julia you'll hear the interview later in today's podcast and she came and you know, shared some crisps with us in our, in, in our compartment, gave us some tips for the train. And uh, yeah, it was, just, uh, uh, it was just so lovely to see her. So lovely to see you, Julia. I hope you're happy back in Kiev. Francis, Francis Sterling. Well, yeah, thanks, David. A highlight for me was seeing the Ukrainian army sniffer dog arrive into our berth, take one sniff at Dom's shoes and recoil. But yes, I did have crisps overnight. I was taking the advice of the hostile environment training team, which said, when you can eat, eat. But for whatever reason, which I cannot get my head around, Dom seems not to want to eat at any point unless it's a sit down meal. So I don't think Dom has now eaten for about 18 or 19 hours. Whilst I'm perfectly content. So I think somebody was paying attention in class, frankly. 
But just to finish off this section from us, yeah, we just arrived up for a week, two weeks of interviews. So if you're in Kiev and see us, do you wave, do you say hello? And it's going to be, I mean, it's, I'm so, I'm, you know, Kiev is a wonderful, wonderful city. I'm so happy to be back. But obviously, it's a very, very somber time. We heard Roland's updates at the beginning there. We heard Natalia's updates. There's not a lot of good news around at the moment. But we're looking to speak to people, understand what's happening here, and we'll do our best to keep on reporting on this war. Roland, is there anything we can answer, anything you, more you'd like to know about our night train? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I just find it I, I'm enjoying listening to you guys get to grips with the Ukrainian night trains I think it's going to be quite, uh, quite enjoyable listening to you or getting to grips with other aspects uh, could you tell us I mean you're obviously going to be doing interviews I don't know how much you want to trail or tell the listeners about exactly what you're doing and what your plans are are you staying in Kiev will you be heading elsewhere so it will mainly be Kiev and Kiev region. There'll be, Dom has sort of winked and nudged and said there'll be senior administration officials. We should be interviewing Alexandra Matvyuchuk, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, in the next few days on camera. Myself and Adelie will be looking at some more long-form uh, audio projects, looking at Jewish life and history in Ukraine in the past and the present. I'm also hoping to go uh, back to Butcher and meet some of the families and people I met that, when I was there two years ago and see how life has changed and what's happening now in, in the town, which obviously became a byword for Russian cruelty and war crimes. So there's quite a, quite a lot going on. We're, I'm very, very excited, actually. Tomorrow we're heading to the Kiev Independent, and regular listeners will know how many Kiev Independent journalists we do bring on to speak to. So we're going to do a series of interviews with some of their team, and then I believe, just to say thank you and congratulations to them for their wonderful reporting over the past few years, we're going to take them out for drinks. And Dom, why were you told off by the train guard? Well, yeah, I was, I, we had a mix-up over the flannels, but she got very upset with me. But we made it, made it up in the end. I just want to say, Roland, and to everyone listening, I mean, we're making, making light of this because it's all, you know, we're excited we're here, day one, blah, blah, blah. But we did arrive during an air raid. The alarms were going off. It was a real couple of glass of cold water in the face to say, look, OK, enjoy yourself, do your job, be professional. But, you know, this is a very, very active war zone that we've entered. So, yes, we have, we have a laugh on a joke, but it's a very serious side to life here. And we're not going to take that for granted as we go on through the week. It's going to be a busy week, though. Be a busy week. Might have to get some sleep, or maybe not. Back to you, Roland, in the studio. Thank you very much. I mean, my my one tip, of course, to France is yes, eat when you can, but make sure you eat your greens, or you'll, you'll develop scurvy. And on a long assignment, living off junk food with no sleep, it builds up. So good luck to the chaps out there. I think we're pretty much wrapping up here. I think Natalia's had to move on. She was pulled over on an Israeli motorway to speak to us. So could I go to Joe for your final thoughts? I will touch on something. That I wrote with a few colleagues, Will Hazel and James Rothwell, for the Sunday Telegraph on what NATO countries are doing to Trump proof the alliance after Donald Trump last week essentially said that he would encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want with NATO countries failing to meet the alliance's 2% of GDP defense spending target. So the idea of Trump proofing, contingency planning, or just basically asking the question, what the hell do we do when Donald Trump? returns as president has been the favourite pastime of NATO diplomats and officials ever since Joe Biden won the keys to the White House. But now it's actually we have to really look at it seriously. Trump has been very loud with his rhetoric and it has sparked concerns about the NATO Article 5, which is its mutual defence clause. Basically, if one member gets attacked, everyone else will come to its rescue. And Donald Trump is basically saying, look, the Americans won't do that if you don't pay your bills, as he would say. So this is what one diplomat said. He said there has been a lot of talk about Trump contingency planning on how to make sure a US president is invested in the security of the transatlantic area. And essentially what we've uncovered is a three-pronged plan to keep Trump in favour of NATO and that Article 5 clause. Point one is pretty evident, it's defence spending. So last week it was announced, and I think covered by Francis on the pod, that 18 of the 31 NATO member states would hit that 2% spending target, which dates back to 2014, a summit in Newport, Wales, when that was originally put on the table. But actually, this is what NATO diplomats are now saying. They are basically saying we have to go further than that if we want to guarantee the continued involvement of the US in NATO. Here's what a Whitehall security source told us. If we all rock up in Washington for the NATO summit with half of Europe still not paying 2% of GDP... That will be an own goal. The summit they're referring to is a summit in the US capital to mark the 75th anniversary of NATO in July. And that is the week before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, where Trump is expected to be selected as the party's nomination for president. 
the second track of diplomacy, and that is with America and Trump potentially directly, is basically NATO stressing that it needs to address Washington's foreign policy priorities. This is what one source said. You have to spend time discussing things that the American president sees as important. So for this, you basically need to look at putting words on the table, mainly about China, to keep Donald Trump happy. Another source described this process as essentially keeping Trump under control with flattery, playing up to his massive ego. And then the final prong is, it's a person. It's the Netherlands caretaker prime minister, Mark Rutte. He's a veteran statesman who has become considered somewhat of a Trump whisperer, a phrase often used to describe Jens Stoltenberg, who has held uh, the NATO Secretary General job since 2014. So, Mr. Rutter appeared to earn Mr. Trump's respect when he publicly contradicted him in 2018 in the White House, interrupting the then president to argue that his trade policies were anti-European. So it's an EU-US trade spat. And basically, Mark Rutter called him up on that and earned his respect by calling him out. So while it isn't formalised that Mark Rutter is going to be Secretary General sometime in April is the rumour, it will essentially, his appointment will result in NATO leaders dropping a previous ambition to install a woman. They looked at Meta Fredriksson, the D- Danish prime minister. They've looked at Ursula von der Leyen, who was blocked by the Germans because they thought she could be too bombastic in her rhetoric towards Vladimir Putin, potentially causing some sort of escalation there. Kaya Kallas, the Estonian prime minister, also has had that same sort of effect being spurned on that front. But Ultimately, it looks like the decision not to appoint a woman is partly fueled by fears that Mr. Trump has, and I quote, a slight misogyny about him that could destabilize the alliance. If you remember back to when he was US president last time, he often used to target Angela Merkel, the German chancellor of the time, basically calling her out because she's a woman, saying, oh, she's not a woman I can do business with, et cetera, et cetera. So they're looking to get a man in who Donald Trump is probably less likely to try and take aim at like he did with Angela Merkel. And look, there's a certain degree of confidence that this will all work. NATO survived four years of Trump already. But there is what essentially is, is a keep calm and manage Trump mantra that has taken over the alliance. And I'll stop there, folks. And good to hear from you all. Thanks very much, Joe. David, if you're still there, is David still there? Does he want to give us a final thought? Just very quickly, as we said, despite all the awful news, it's such a pleasure to be back in Kiev. It's such a wonderful city, and I'm so looking forward to seeing some of our friends and some of the people we want to talk to to try and do our best to understand what's going on and throw as much light on on, on everything as possible. Thank you very much, Roland and Joe, and I know you'll be anchoring so much of this week, so huge thanks from all of us. It's such a pleasure to work with you, and it's really great to hear you. And yeah, we'll do our best this week and do our best to come on as as often as possible and update you as to what we're seeing uh, and everything that we're doing. But thank you very much, Roland. Uh, You are more than welcome. It just remains for me to say that this is, of course, this is the anniversary week, right? So the uh, the full-scale invasion of the war in Ukraine began two years ago, I believe, on, on Saturday, which is part of the reason why the guys are, are in Ukraine. And that is, a, that is a sobering moment for us all to take stock. The death of Alexei Navalny, uh, the fall of Avdiivka. Avdiivka has been a frontline town since 2014, 2015. I, mean, I, I personally visited it several times over the years. It was a, a massive stronghold and its loss cannot be painted in any other way than as, as, as a very significant moment. So we are going to continue to keep our eyes on this war and, and we'll do our, our very best to keep you up to date. So listeners, about half an hour ago, we gave you an update on the night train to Kiev. And now, as you can hear, the train is not moving. We've approached the Ukrainian border and we bumped into a friend of the podcast, Julia Timoshenko, who's joining us in our cabin. Julia, great to see you on the train. Hi, thank you so much. It's very nice to bump into you guys. Why Why do we think we, we stopped? Why can't we hear anything? Potentially, I don't know if that's true or not, the Polish farmers who have been blocking Ukrainian grain exports for now a few months uh, are currently 
blocking the railway as well. Uh, well, at least they blocked this specific train that we're on um, on the way here. According to the lovely train ladies, uh, they had troubles coming in. We don't know if this is happening right now or not, but it's very interesting how is it going to develop because up until today, I think they've never blocked the railway actually. And Julia, what, what are you traveling back from? Where have you come from? I am coming back from the Munich Security Conference um, where I did a small panel at the official side event organized by America House and Aspen Institute. And it was actually on uh, Russian disinformation and social media and how it kind of like spreads now um, on a lot of these issues, including the farmers issues in, in Europe. We saw you at Helm train station. Could you describe for our listeners just what that experience is like? What you know, If you were to paint us a picture of what it feels like travelling through here to get back into Ukraine. Well, it's definitely very exhausting because you need to hop on a train and Warsaw travel to Helm or maybe Przemysl if you're travelling through another border town. Then you need to get out of the train and then wait for a Ukrainian train to come in. And you basically have like uh, an hour, an hour and a half in this very small train station. Oops, Ooh, we're moving. Kind of. Maybe making not. Noise. Or maybe making noise. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we were excited there for a second. Sorry, Chuck. No, no, that's okay. I, w- I was also like, oh, <laughs> the sounds. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very small train station. And it usually is filled with a lot of people traveling from all sorts of places. Lots of journalists there all the time. So you guys are not the, the only ones. And it has like just one grocery store nearby and maybe like one small cafe or whatever i don't know where did you get the chips <laughs> <laughs> at what we would call an off license <laughs> just a, yeah a very small news agent just by the station which was probably the busiest news agent i've ever seen yeah and we we think that uh, polish farmers may be missing out on some business opportunities right there <laughs> because they could have made the money that they're losing on the grain uh definitely by just like selling sandwiches and a few things to people yeah so finally, Julia, just so we're, we're in here, we're, we're all in one cabin. What's your cabin like? Who are you traveling with? Uh, I'm traveling with two other um, young girls, and uh, it seems like uh, one of them has not traveled by a train a lot, although she's Ukrainian because she's been asking very basic questions, and we were explaining to her how like the border check works and stuff. So maybe it's like her first time coming back in a while. And what, what's your advice for us? Some of whom are on our first night train, some of whom are not, but what's your advice? What like, basic mistakes should we, should we not do? What should we be thinking of? Well, I think if it gets really, really hot in your tiny room, definitely open the door because the heating might kick in during the night. I really love this. I don't know why. I feel like Ukrzaliznetsi, which is the Ukrainian train company, um, has like some sort of quota on how much... like cold they need to burn during the winter so they heat the train up so much sometimes that you can't like breathe right right now it's okay like i would say but like sometimes it gets really really bad <laughs> it is getting hot in here but that's mainly potentially just because dom nichols is only wearing a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> just just one question from me you said there that it's mostly women that travel on this train can you just talk a little bit more about that um yeah it's mostly women because uh, ukrainian men um from age of 18 uh, to 60, I believe, which is the military conscription, I think, um, age. Uh, they cannot leave the country unless it's um, unless they have like a sick relative, I think th- three or more children, and also potentially like somebody like sick in their family that they need to take care of. And they they can also leave for some business reasons, but that that system is very flawed and actually very difficult. And unfortunately. Some of my friends who have like very um, like strong reasons to sometimes like travel for like work purposes cannot get permits. Uh, so it's mostly women who are able to get in and out of the country. Julia, we've started moving, so you might have to grab hold of something in a minute. But you you just come back from the Munich Security Conference. What was the mood like there? This is obviously a couple of days after Navalny Navalny's death. President Zelensky was at Munich got a lot of things happening at the moment with uh, Germany and, and France and bilateral defence agreements. What was the mood in Munich? Uh, obviously it's difficult to assess the overall mood because it's such a huge conference but there's definitely 
a lot of talks on like stepping up support for Ukraine uh, because it's not just the death of Navalny, but the day before I arrived there on February 16th, uh, Ukraine officially announced it's with withdrawing from Avdiivka. And that's the city that has been like a big forepost of Ukrainian defense for over, I mean, almost a decade now since 2014. And um, that obviously was like a huge morale downfall for the Ukrainian society. But at least we're happy that our guys are um, like those who survived are safe and moved to like safer positions. But um, I think a lot of European le leaders like are waking up and realizing that Putin is not going to stop against anything and like if anything this like killing of Navalny which is we know it's it was a killing like we can't say that he died of like some unknown reason I think it showed again if like thousands of death and thousands of uh, like, kidnapped Ukrainian children didn't show some European leaders that Putin is a butcher that's not going to stop against anything. That I think that this like death of Navalny, who a lot of European leaders believed that would be this messiah who could save Russia, um, I think that really gave them a wake-up call. Just very, very quickly, Julia, you mentioned the fall of Avdivka there. Um, I think you're doing some fundraising for that. Can you tell us what you're fundraising for exactly and why? Uh, well, that was kind of just a, a very kind of impromptu and a quick thing that me and my friend Marichka Buchenikova, another Ukrainian activist, put together because uh, we saw a lot of people tweeting about Navalny and obviously his killing is horrific and sad, but we really saw it as an opportunity to turn people's like anger and frustration and, and action that could bring um, some change and impact in Ukraine because that's a battlefield for the future of Ukraine, but also Russia, because the strongest opposition to Russian and Putin's regime right now is Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian people. And uh, we put together just like very quickly, just uh, our own kind of PayPal um, addresses and ways to send us money and said that we're just going to compile uh, the funds and then transfer them to specifically defenders who have been fighting in the Avdiivka direction. Um, so I think in, in just 48 hours we raised like $5,500-ish and uh, we're going to be distributing it to uh, trusted fundraisers. Okay. Are, we, are we in trouble? What's happening? No. Yeah, she yelled at us. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, she, she, she said, like, is it a, an English lesson where you're speaking so much in English? <laughs> that's, a that's, 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 a, that's, that's a very that's common train experience, by the way. Like, yeah. that's like people yelling at each other. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't like a I can't see. So, was that not a guard or not? Like, that was just uh, a normal. No, no, that's just like a woman from another. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very normal. Yeah, sometimes sometimes people fight over like who opens the window or not. Oh, Julia, thank you so much. It's so lovely. It's so lovely to see you. Turning up in Helm Station, turning around yes. and being like, oh, yes, pretty cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was this is really funny. The the ending of this. Like right, some more chips? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Nice. James Rothwell, our Berlin correspondent, has an exclusive interview with Kirsty Kaliulaid, the former president of Estonia. Thank you very much for doing this interview. We're really curious to hear your thoughts about what on earth is going on with Trump and NATO and all the rest of it. But I wanted to start by asking you a question about the Estonian border. I understand that the Interior Minister gave a tour to journalists in December where she talked about the need for more technology on the border to act as a deterrent. And she was speaking in the context of migrants, I think, trying to cross and causing trouble. Is that border just for keeping out migrants or are there other threats on that border that the country is concerned about? Well, basically, of course, uh, the main threat on the uh, Lithuanian, Polish, uh, Finnish uh, border has been the migrant threat. Russia has been pushing migrants into these countries, hoping to either cause disturbances by that or then get nice videos when the border guards of the EU member states do not, uh, in their understanding, respect the rules and so on. But we have to remember that for most of those migrants, Russia is a safe place to be. Maybe it's not a safe place for Russian opposition, but definitely for the migrants coming from African nations, uh, Russia is the first safe place. So actually they should demand asylum there. So it is not the legal action by Russia. 
And of course, countries have taken uh, measures. So indeed, for us, it is easier than for some others because our land border with Russia is slightly over 100 kilometers. Only so compare that to Finnish. The question of does the border have to endure different type of shocks, then we have to be very aware that we have an aggressive neighbor. And I guess that is why we have our NATO to make sure that our borders are defended. So, of course, indeed, we need to be vigilant also on, on that count. Right now, of course, if you look what we have behind the Baltic and Finnish borders compared to a pre-aggression time, it's far less, which, by the way, has busted Putin's uh, statement that NATO is a danger for Russia, because if NATO were a danger to you, then fighting in Ukraine, you would never deplete your forces close to NATO's borders. But this is what we have. Are there concerns in Estonia about how well defended that border currently is, if, for example, there were to be a military provocation at the border or an incursion by Russian troops? Our allies and our uh, intelligence services together are confident that our intelligence is good enough to discover a relatively big window of opportunity for us if we see any movements which we do not understand or which indicate danger. As I said, we haven't seen them, so there is no danger short term, probably not mid term neither. But this window has to be so big that we will be able to take the steps which Russia will have only one way of reading. No kidding, this is serious. This will not pass. As General Herem, our uh, chief of defense forces, says, maybe we cannot avoid Russians thinking these thoughts, but we can stop these thoughts before they materialize. And that will be the objective of allies. And what sort of steps would those involve? Would that involve, for example, placing Estonian and NATO soldiers on the border in the event of a build-up of Russian troops on their side? That would mean something else. Frankly speaking, all Baltic states have pretty strong NATO uh, battalion groups. And in Estonia's case, they are not far from the border at all. And considering nowadays, what does it mean being on the border, being somewhat removed? As I said, we have to make sure that we realize and then we have to be able to send the message of force because the kind of logic of reason doesn't work with Russians. It's only the logic of force. How exactly that will be done, I think that is not a kind of a discussion worth having right now. How well defended would you say the border is in terms of natural defences? Is it a border that's difficult to defend? It's a border difficult to attack as well because one third is roughly river, half roughly is lake, fifth biggest lake in Europe, and the rest is pork. So uh, both sides have their difficulties in handling that territory, but I am quite sure that we are adequately protected. And if Putin is thinking of a foolhardy incursion over Bog and River, what, what would your message be to him? Don't even try. NATO is there to defend well every centimetre or square centimetre of all NATO allies, because this is what our alliance is about. And I believe that when uh, NATO's EFP started out, it was a tripwire. Now it isn't a tripwire, it is a deterrent force. This is obvious. Thanks very much for that. It's really useful, I think, to, for our readers to get a sense of what that border is like and bring home the practicalities of defending it. I wondered if I could also ask you about the British contribution to NATO. There's a big debate in the UK at the moment about whether the UK invests enough in its military. And I won't ask you to speculate on that because I know it's a different country, but is there anything that the UK you feel could do that it isn't doing yet? Is there any specific ask that you would have as a senior voice in Estonia? That well, do? I've been following our deep and intense defence cooperation since 2016. I've seen EFP arriving. I've seen EFP first taking seat in Tapa military base, in a rotational temporary basis, which has then been extended to our understanding that it is there permanently. Brits and French form our EFP with other nations also jumping in occasionally. And also we value very much the nuclear deterrence capability, of course, of UK, which exists there for NATO. 
And indeed, I believe that all the other, well, actions which have been taken, like a very high readiness reaction forces together with the Baltic Sea states and all these activities are all leading into the right direction. And what I really want to stress is that if we compare, let's say, strategic level exercises before EFP and when EFP has established, we see that EFP has worked like a laboratory of providing information for NATO's troops about interoperability in this kind of territorial defense setting, which, for example, British troops normally do not think that much about. And we realized soon after EFP started that the strategic level thinking has very much shifted from we will do something when they cross the border to we will do something when our intelligence tells us we need to beef up our deterrence in the Baltic states. And this is probably the biggest evolution I've seen. And the next step, what we now need to do, of course, and I believe that the inclusion of Finland and Sweden into NATO space is a big catalyst for that. We've always had the problem of A2 AD from Russian side, or that the Russians will close off the airspace so we cannot bring in follow-on forces. And now we have the unique opportunity to turn this around. And I believe that, of course, UK together with Nordics has a role in it. UK Marine was actually very important in Estonian uh, freedom war after the October Revolution, so more than a century away. You were the ones who gave weapons and you were the ones who helped us to establish our country. So we have a long-standing trust and hope, uh, which of course didn't materialize during the Second World War. But thereafter, this cooperation now and particularly with EFP, this has been fantastic. And I would let it to develop and evolve as the risk patterns demand without any concrete pushes here. But of course, the very obvious push for now is we need to win this war in Ukraine. And there, of course, I would say that maybe Latvia, Estonia, with their 1% of the GDP spending over two years on Ukrainian war effort, is something of an example. If the bigger nations achieve that, let's say, 0.5, we would be outspending Russia. And the Estonian Ministry of Defense has put together a very good paper which shows our way how to win this war. And it's very well set in macroeconomic terms that over two years, Rammstein coalition has spent only 0.2% of its collective GDP. And this means that Ukraine can afford, on average, about 5 billion of spending per month on military activities, and Russia 10. Now imagine if we went to 0.4, we would draw even with Russians. And if we went to 0.5, we would definitely be ahead. Can Russia match our spending in that case? Let's not forget that they are spending 30% of their budget already now. So if we doubled they will not be able to go to 60% of the budget for long term. So finally, and it is so sad to see that we are discussing billions which we have given, but if you put them into the proportion terms, this is why Ukraine can only fire one shell and Russia can fire 10. This must change and this must urgently change. It's relatively tiny. And we have also the public opinion in whole Europe which says, European people find it incomprehensible that war might reach us. At the same time, they are supportive of Ukrainian war effort. This for me is like put two and two together, and if necessary, create a temporary war tax or something. Estonia raised VAT by two percentage points this year. Income tax will rise two percentage points next year. This all helps us to spend 3% of our GDP on defense, which means that we can actually spend quite a lot also on Ukraine. I'd just like to return briefly to the nuclear umbrella, which you mentioned earlier. As you know, there's a bit of a debate in Germany at the moment about whether an EU nuclear deterrent is needed. Jens Stoltenberg said that was not a helpful conversation yesterday. Could you tell me a bit about the Estonian position? Estonian position has been normally pretty close to Jens's position on whatsoever. And we really appreciate Jens's long stay through all these difficult years in, uh, in NATO's uh, chair. I've worked in EU uh, as an EU auditor for 12 years, and I know there is one thing which EU does the best, and this is cohesion funding. And it can be cohesion on rural areas, whatever. Cohesion on defence spending, therefore, should be what Europe can do. How this defence spending then is allocated, this for me is clearly NATO's job. 
And why I believe that this is doable, Europe normally rises to uh, the demand. For example, we do not prop up by treat each other's financial spending, yet we have ESM, which does it. And similarly, we can do uh, European defence funding. We're already doing funding for Ukraine from EU budget, which is remarkable, considering the treaty says no propping up each other's defence budgets neither, and now we do it for the third country. So having EU resources to finance this kind of deterrent, this I'm sure we can support. But I'd leave military matters to military institutions, precisely also that there are less and less EU members who are not NATO members. So why should we now start to have a cumbersome mechanism to somehow separate our deterrence? This would not be wise. The reason I bring it up is that because there's a lot of concern among some EU and NATO states about Trump's engagement with NATO, that does seem to have led to anxiety about whether the US can be ten- depended on to provide that nuclear deterrent? No, this is true. But specifically, I think of British and French nuclear deterrence as a good and reasonable thing to have over European <laughs> territory. But that doesn't exclude it from being part of a NATO system rather than part of the EU system. Because whichever is the US administration's position vis-a-vis NATO, we will all be there still. There is no such thing like a veto rule on cooperating on necessary defence in Europe among European NATO partners. Except perhaps for Hungary recently in terms of cooperating on uh, efforts to tackle Putin. This is, yes, indeed a different story, but what Hungary can do is negotiate about, like everybody else, for example, Ukraine membership in NATO, Ukraine membership in EU, annual budget distributions to Ukraine, but it doesn't affect the military capabilities Europe has in any way. So I would keep these things very clearly separated and in separate envelopes. But I do agree that discussion on strategic autonomy, which was a root term once, is needed in this sense that, frankly speaking, Europe as a big economic power should be able to take care of the, let's say, middling military powers around itself also a little bit more independently. And we are moving towards that target And it is, of course, sad that we need the rudeness of remarks to get us really take this seriously, that we have to be able to handle our surroundings ourselves, to leave also US more free to, let's say, deal with the Asian issues. This should be really in the additional thinking in all what NATO is doing now. Europe, big economy, able to defend itself, US more freedom to therefore take the global responsibility and this way it will work best and finally I'm a very pragmatic person wherever the funding comes from whatever are the motivations if it keeps us all safe and the free world is able to push back on the autocrats then it's all good for me Understood I'd like to ask you about Iran as well we know that Iran is providing Russia with drones and missiles for use in Ukraine we're starting to see these parallel conflicts unfolding in both Ukraine and in the Red Sea and in Israel as well, people are talking about global alliances, possibly coalescing around Vladimir Putin. But I wanted to ask about Iran and Estonia. Has Estonia picked up on any kind of threat to the country by Iran, such as, for example, the IRGC having involvement over on the Russian side of the border, hybrid warfare potentially against Estonia by Iran? Is that something that's cropped up in discussions? I would not say specifically about Iran, but definitely all these other kind of front lines or tensions nowadays in our global world, I mean, we all have diasporas coming from various sides of various conflicts. And then, of course, you have to deal with them daily and monitor what is going on. But frankly speaking, Estonia being quite tiny then, for example, for info operations against democratic processes, doesn't matter what happens to Estonian democracy in the big picture. I would be more vigilant elsewhere. As far as all this kind of axis of evil converging, well, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, of course it is worrisome. And what I've liked about Munich Security Conference this year has been exactly the recognition that this is it. And this means that all the other processes, free shoring, but also maybe 
more free trade, therefore, between the freedom-loving blocs like US, Europe, and these discussions are back on table as well, because after all, we need to permanently create wealth for our citizens to be able to sustain the understanding that our worldview is the best. We really believe to it, but we have to prove it daily to our citizens as well. And of course, citizens have to partake in these debates because democracy is a, is a thing which you have to stand up for daily. So it's all, it's all linked, it's all complex, and the axis of evil is there, no denying of it. Are we in Estonia specifically looking at every angle? I'm sure our services are, but not too worried about that right now. And now we've got it onto the topic of the axis of evil, as you put it. I think there's a lot of anxiety in Europe at the moment that we might actually be heading to World War Three, something that people used to almost joke about or talk about in a rather abstract context. Now headlines are being written about World War Three, comparisons being drawn with the global alliances drawn up in the early 20th century. And our readers think about it a lot as well. What's your position on that rather big and perhaps troublesome question? Well, I've heard this as well, and if it's a battle call, I think it is a good thing. If we realise that this is what is at stake, that we have a train wreck happening slow-mo in front of our eyes, and the leaders of this free world actually have the budgetary needs, as I just talked, which are not even too big to contemplate, that we can so easily avoid it. And what is really sometimes unnerving is that last year... All the West was very self-congratulatory here in Munich. We are doing everything. Ukraine's going to win. We have supported so much. Now, this year, I would say we are more on the same line like Ukrainians were because they were the only ones last year who said too little and too late and it's problematic. Now we are all recognizing that we are not doing enough. But now we have this problem that everybody says it feels like someone or somebody should spend twice the amount we are spending. The room is full of prime ministers who make these decisions. Someone and somebody are not going to spend it. It is the governments who have to lead, make it clear to our people without unnecessarily scaring them that this is what is at stake. And I believe we are doing it relatively well in Nordics, taken as a whole. There is a very public debate about what needs to be done to avoid this war coming out of Ukraine and becoming a more general war. And it hasn't scared our people, but it has motivated our people to accept that there will be actually quite considerable, at least economic consequences of fighting this war effort. And I would advise all politicians to honestly lead their people in this matter. And finally, a question about Trump and NATO spending, the comments that have cast a bit of a pall over this conference. I've spoken to quite a few former officials in, from various European governments over the last few days. Some people think that this really is the sort of Trump ideology, that this is about devaluing NATO, that this is about ripping up Article 5 before he's even come into power. And other people see it as a kind of rerun of his previous campaign where he also talked about NATO members not paying their dues and it was a sort of Trumpian ploy to scare people and make them pay more money. I'm just curious where you sit on that spectrum, if you like, of what might actually be going on here. I tend to take the second view, yes, uh, that I think because we heard a lot of this from 2016 to 21, and the sad thing is it was more effective than politeness from Barack Obama. So why exactly should you not repeat it? This is my, my one take. Second take is Trump, the first uh, presidency, actually stood quite strong in, uh, in northeast uh, Europe. And if we think about the troops in Poland, which is still evolving, and cooperation and high-level visits close to the NATO's eastern border, all this was present. And of course, we all realize that the problem is unpredictability here. And uh, this is something which we equally worry. But on the other hand, I've spoken to President Trump many times, uh, among other things about, for example, their action in Syria during Trump's presidency, where they actually hit Wagner forces. And, and I asked, how came that he managed to be strong there? I mean, we know that sometimes people had drawn red lines and then not executed them. And he said something which was very interesting. You know, Kirsty, they showed me that there had been children who had been gassed. And therefore, I am quite sure that Ukrainian children who have been killed, raped, kidnapped, is something which matters to all US Republicans. And therefore, I'm confident that even before we reach to the elections in the autumn, 
U.S. will not let Ukraine down. President Trump once said in a press conference in White House with all Baltic heads of states, we have never let you down, we shall never let you down. I'm ready to remind that to everybody, including him himself, and I believe that uh, he also stands true to his word. That's really interesting because the received wisdom, I suppose, on this election race is that Biden will be a status quo that's perhaps good for Ukraine and that Trump will be a, to, to paraphrase what people are saying, a disaster. It, it sounds like you're saying we should be a bit more cautious about that and think a bit more about Trump's record from his last term. And Fortifying and reminding that this was indeed going on, I think, has a value in this discussion, which we right now sit and finally every democratic nation chooses their leaders and we have to cooperate with these leaders. And of course, Biden administration is a classic relying on institutions administration, which I used to. On the other hand, we are still stuck. Why? Because unlike, let's say, Norway or some other countries where these packages of help have been agreed anonymously, this has not been case in the US, so we have to work with Democrats, Republicans. This is what Munich Security Conference always does best, and we keep doing it. You strike me as being cautiously optimistic that the Trump presidency could actually be very good for the European security based on conversations you've had with them in the past. No, as I say, I can base myself on that, but mm. the element of unpredictability is always uncomfortable because our worry is that Kremlin must every morning, every lunchtime and every evening have the right reading of our plans, our capabilities. And this must be there, I am sure. And of course, some remarks while actually making European leaders reactivate their efforts are in this sense good that they, I mean, galvanize action. And on the other hand, of course, they are adding to this unpredictability element, which we do not want. But I'm not in any office, so obviously for me it is easier to talk. And I might even jokingly say that if you do not want to defend those who spend less than 2%, then please bear in mind that everybody at the border of Russia is spending even 3% now, so Russians never can get that far. Is there any other sort of point that you think we haven't covered that you think is particularly important for readers in the UK to think about? I, I think we really need these macro numbers to get into the brains of people that we have a massive opportunity and it is quite uncomparable to anything which happened even during the Cold War when everybody's defense spending was around 3% of the GDP. We have a massive opportunity with pittance to win this war and not to let it develop into a worse situation than we have already. And I would advise all electorates in all countries, even if it might mean sometimes an added tax for a temporary period at least, to push their politicians. And I would advise all politicians to lead their nations so that this gets done. It's urgent now and, and I think this year is going to be very decisive. Understood. Cool. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to Ukraine, the latest. Your support and attention means so much to all of us. And just in case you didn't know, The Telegraph runs another podcast you may be interested in. Battle Lines is our weekly global affairs and defence podcast where we look at conflicts and unrest around the world with The Telegraph's sterling foreign desk. On Battle Lines, you'll hear updates and news on everything from the violence in the Middle East and the Red Sea, civil wars in Sudan and Myanmar, to unrest in Ecuador. Join myself, Roland Oliphant, Sophia Yan and Natalia Vasilieva on Battle Lines, published every Friday. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and to stay on top of all our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at telegraph.co.uk forward stroke Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. You can also get in touch directly or ask questions to or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on X, formerly known as Twitter. You can find our handle in the description of this episode. And as ever, we are especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear, Rachel Porter and Georgia Cohn. 
Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.